How do you maximize strength and hypertrophy at the same time? Honestly, a lot of lifters go about this wrong and end up spinning their wheels for both training goals. So today, we're gonna break down this common training approach, which is often called power building. I'm gonna break it down for you so you can feel confident in your approach and just focus on training hard. What's going on? My name is Josh Pellant. I'm a strength coach and researcher working on my PhD on the topic of training volume. I'm also an owner here at Data Driven Strength alongside Zach Robinson. Zach and I are excited to be bringing some new content to our YouTube channel, all aimed at helping you maximize strength and hypertrophy by integrating research into practice. So be sure to subscribe, turn on the notification bell as we have a lot of exciting stuff coming your way soon. To understand how to design a power building program, we must first understand the training variables that drive each strength and hypertrophy. For this, we can look to the research. So let's start with probably the most popular training variable, which is training volume. Volume is simply the number of sets performed per muscle group or per movement per week. For hypertrophy, training volume seems to be quite important. As we can see from a 2017 meta-analysis of 15 studies from Schoenfeld and colleagues, groups performing nine or more sets per week saw an average of 8.2% growth compared to 5.8% in groups performing less than nine sets. Now, this difference didn't quite reach statistical significance, but there's a clear relationship here. In fact, some data even suggests that benefits can increase up to 20 plus sets per muscle group or per movement per week. Another meta-analysis, this time from 2022 from Baz Val and colleagues, analyzed six studies and found nominally greater hypertrophy in the quads, biceps, and the triceps in groups training with 20 or more sets per week compared to 12 to 20 sets per week. The difference only reached statistical significance in the triceps, but again, this general relationship between volume and hypertrophy just overall seems pretty consistent in the research. Now, on the other hand, for strength outcomes, volume also seems to matter, but likely to a lesser degree. A 2017 meta-analysis of nine studies from Ralston and colleagues included studies that compared single set protocols to multi-set protocols. So in other words, they looked at strength gains between groups that did one set per exercise compared to multiple sets per exercise. And this analysis found significantly greater gains in those higher volume groups, which ended up being about six to 12 sets per week. And again, that was compared to the lower volume groups, which ended up being five or less sets per week. So ultimately, volume seems to matter for strength as well. However, if we dig a little bit deeper, volume may not matter as much for strength as it does for hypertrophy. So when looking at the 2017 Schoenfeld meta-analysis for hypertrophy and the 2017 Ralston meta-analysis for strength, we can use the effect sizes to approximate how much additional gains you get from additional volume. And for our purposes here, you can think of an effect size as a measure of relative gains in strength or hypertrophy. So for hypertrophy, doing about five or less sets per week resulted in the ballpark of 60% of the quote unquote maximum gains. Whereas for strength, doing a similar amount of volume resulted in approximately 80% of the quote unquote maximum gains. Now, this isn't a perfect comparison and there are always limitations in research, but it ultimately supports what we frequently see in practice, which is that less weekly volume is required to get most of your potential strength gains so long as these sets are rather specific, but more total sets are required to get most of your potential hypertrophy gains. Now, for this volume or for these sets that are performed in the gym, how close to failure do they need to be for each strength and hypertrophy? So this is where RIR or repetitions in reserve comes in. So to quickly make sure we're on the same page, one repetition in reserve simply means that one more rep could be completed before failing. Two repetitions in reserve simply means that two more reps could be completed before failing, etc. Luckily, our research team recently pre-printed a series of meta-regressions, and this was led by Zach, my counterpart here at Data Driven Strength, and we looked at this relationship for both hypertrophy and for strength separately. 
For hypertrophy, our model of 26 studies showed greater gains as RAR decreased, or in other words, greater gains in hypertrophy as lifters trained closer to failure. Now, there's a lot of limitations to this analysis, and it's unclear the exact nature of the relationship, especially as we get more and more data in this research field over time. However, I think it's safe to say for now that training to or close to failure is quite important for hypertrophy. Now, on the other hand, for strength, uh, we did an analysis of 54 studies, and we see here essentially no relationship. So as RAR decreases, or as you get closer to failure, if anything, we see less strength gains. Now, after seeing that relationship, you may be thinking to yourself, like, what the heck is this guy talking about? So I can just go in and do light, easy sets and still max my strength? Well, no, that's obviously not true. And that's why it's important to emphasize that our analysis only included what's called load equated studies. So in other words, the percentage of one rep max had to be the same between the two groups that were being compared. And the only thing that differed was the number of repetitions performed in each set. So this means that once you have a given percentage of your max on the bar, how close to failure you train doesn't seem to really matter that much for strength. So this leads me to the variable of load or the percentage of your one rep max that's on the bar. So if your max deadlift is 200 kilograms and you're doing a set with 150 kilograms, that's 75% of your one rep max. Now load seems to matter a lot for strength and it seems to be our most predictive variable of gains. As you can see from a pre-printed analysis of well over 100 studies by Swinton and colleagues, there is a convincing increase in strength gains as a result of training with a higher percentage of your one rep max. And this just makes sense when you think about the principle of specificity. Ultimately, powerlifting tests your ability to lift heavy loads. That's what strength is. So you have to lift heavy loads in order to get better at it. On the other hand, for hypertrophy, a 2021 analysis of 20 studies by Rafalo and colleagues found that lower loads, which they defined as less than 60% of your one rep max, compared to higher loads, which they defined as more than 60% of your one rep max, resulted in similar hypertrophy outcomes. And if you combine this meta-analysis with some other research in the area, it seems that as long as you're lifting with anywhere in the range of 30% to 85% of your one rep max, the load doesn't seem to really matter for hypertrophy. So in short, our primary variables for hypertrophy seem to be a volume and proximity to failure. Whereas for strength, our primary variable seems to be load or the percentage of your one rep max that's on the bar. For the nerds watching, you're probably thinking the last variable I'm going to talk about is frequency, which is the number of times per week a muscle or movement is trained. And I will, but it's pretty simple, so I'm gonna keep it brief. So from some recent meta-analyses, specifically a 2018 analysis from Gerchkin colleagues for strength, and a 2019 analysis from Schoenfeld and colleagues for hypertrophy, it seems that frequency does not independently drive either training outcome. Now, just to keep things as practical as possible, I'll just tell you what I like to do in practice when writing programs for a DDS client interested in a power building type of approach. So usually each muscle is going to be trained about twice a week on average. And then if we think specifically in terms of the main lifts that people like to focus on for strength, especially power lifters, in the squat, it's usually trained around two times per week. The bench press usually trained around two to four times per week. And the deadlift usually trained one to two times per week. Now there's a lot of nuance, a lot of room for individualization. So go ahead and comment below if you wanna see a full video on training frequency. So to recap, here's a table showing you what variables seem to independently matter for each strength and hypertrophy. Volume seems to matter a lot for hypertrophy, but only a bit for strength. Proximity to failure seems to matter a lot for hypertrophy, but not much at all for strength. Load seems to matter not really much at all for hypertrophy, but seems to matter a lot for strength. And frequency doesn't seem to be a primary variable for either. If there's one thing you should take away from this video, 
It's that strength and hypertrophy training are not the same. And this is where many people go wrong with a power building type approach. A lot of lifters will take a shotgun approach and try to maximize everything all at once. They'll do lots of sets on squat, bench press, and deadlift with high loads and very close to failure. This approach is suboptimal for both outcomes and can lead to ultimately you spinning your wheels. For strength, it'll be hard to have quality sets with high loads due to very high fatigue from this sort of shotgun approach. And for hypertrophy, you may not be able to tolerate much total training volume. Further, for a lot of lifters, squat, bench, and deadlift are not ideal hypertrophy movements. So given this shotgun approach is not great for a lot of lifters, let me introduce you to the sniper approach, which I like to call polarized training. Polarized training means that every set has a purpose. You're either trying to get an excellent stimulus for strength or an excellent stimulus for hypertrophy. To get an excellent stimulus for strength, again, we can use high loads and low to moderate volume. To achieve this, you can use what's called a top set. As the name suggests, top sets are the heaviest sets of the day and they're specific to the lift you want to get better at. So if you're deadlifting, you can do a top set of the deadlift itself or a close variation like a pause deadlift. A good ballpark for top sets is one to four reps with 85 to 95% of your max. Then after that top set, you can get a bit more specific practice through what are called back offsets. Back offsets can be anywhere from two to 10 reps in the 70 to 90% range. After a couple of these back offsets, it's unlikely that more sets on the main lifts will make a massive difference for strength gains. And if you just keep beating your head against the wall with more of these back offsets, you might just leave yourself with little energy for the rest of the session. So once you've gotten the highest return on investment you can for your strength focused sets, then just move on to sets that are a really, really good stimulus for hypertrophy. It's generally going to be better to do this on other exercises. Think exercises like leg press, Romanian deadlifts, or machine chest press. These exercises will also allow you to expose the prime movers in the main lifts to longer muscle lengths or a more stretched position, which from some recent research seems to be helpful for hypertrophy. Also, these exercises generally allow you to push close to failure in a very safe manner and also tolerate a good amount of training volume. And then these principles for hypertrophy can also be used for muscles not very involved in the squat, bench press, and deadlift. Think things like pull down variations for the lats and curl variations for the biceps. Now, you may have noticed at this point that I've been rather vague in terms of exact numbers for each training variable, and this is on purpose. At Data Driven Strength, some lifters we work with only do a couple sets of bench press per week, and others perform 20 or well over that. So in other words, the exact application of these principles is subject to individualization. And this leads me to an important point. Some people can do really well with a lot of sets performed on the main lifts of squat, bench press, and deadlift. In our experience, this seems to be related to the quote unquote build of the athlete. For example, someone that squats relatively upright with a lot of forward knee travel can probably get a lot of quad growth from squats. And as a result, they can do really well with a less polarized approach. In fact, we can look at a sub-analysis that we've performed when only looking at studies using high loads of 80% of one rep max or more. In these studies, the relationship between training closer to failure and hypertrophy is considerably less dramatic. So if you don't feel beat up from it and you feel you can get a good hypertrophy stimulus from one of the main lifts, you can perform a lot of sets with say 75% of your one rep max or more on the main lift, and you may find that to be actually a very efficient approach for you. Now that we understand the principles for a good power building approach, let's zoom out and consider how these variables might change over the course of months. And the fancy word for this concept is periodization. 
The good news is that a lot of lifters probably don't need to worry about periodizing their training, especially if you haven't been training productively for at least a few years. However, if you're limited on time or want to switch things up here and there, you can have a slight emphasis on hypertrophy or slight emphasis on strength at any given time. In a hypertrophy biased phase, you can simply decrease the load and or sets on the main lifts and increase the sets and or train even closer to failure for your hypertrophy work. Then in strength biased phases, you can just do the opposite. In strength phases, the name of the game is feeling invigorated for your top sets. So don't be afraid to pull back a decent amount on your hypertrophy work to make this happen. As long as this isn't making up more than about 20% of your total training time over the course of say a whole year, you're unlikely to compromise your total hypertrophy. To wrap things up, your programming will become more productive for both strength and hypertrophy if you take a polarized approach and make sure each set is very efficient for either strength or hypertrophy. Now, there's a lot more we can discuss here, such as individual level considerations based on weak point analysis, advanced volume cycling strategies, and more. Let us know what you want to see from us in the comments below. And if you want more free content like this video directly in your inbox, sign up for our newsletter, which is the first link below. We'll see you next time.